1929, the world saw the onset of the Great Depression. The Depression started in earnest with a crash on Wall Street, caused by those who hoarded the wealth. Yet millions upon millions who weren't responsible for the travesty were suddenly without jobs, without access to food, couldn't take care of their families, lost their homes, lost their farms, lost everything. You all know the story. What you may not know is the story of a little game that was born during the Great Depression. And that game is today called Monopoly. But before it was Monopoly, it was called the Landlord's Game. And its original intent might surprise you. The secret history behind Monopoly is that it was created by a woman in the Great Depression named Lizzie J. Maggie. And her original intention was to use the game to teach people about the dangers of economic inequality. She expected that at the end of every game, players would come to understand the hopeless nature of hoarding wealth. <laughs> Worked out. Her game exploded in popularity and became an underground hit. It was used as an organizing tool to, for tenants to help teach each other about how the upper class and landlords were ripping them off, consolidating their wealth in a way that would never give regular people a chance. So during the Depression, individuals reproduced the games in their own homes, and they shared it with their friends and their families and their neighbors. That's until a man named Charles Darrow took the game, altered it a bit, spun it so that it was pro-monopoly, and sold it to Parker Brothers. And so the most popular game in the world, whose message is to financially destroy your opponents through economic warfare, was originally invented to warn people of the dangers of such actions. The tale of the landlord's game and monopoly is truly a tragic comedy portraying our decline into a capitalist quagmire. Today, we face an economy that is similarly, similarly struggling. It's sputtering and it's trying to find its way back to what once was. Now, just like Maggie did when she created the Landlord's Game, people are searching for creative solutions and ways to get out of this mess. Unfortunately, right now, there are still over 8 million people without jobs. And that's not counting the people that are below the poverty line. That doesn't count the people that have been looking for a job so long they've dropped out of the system. That doesn't count the people who have part-time jobs that need full-time jobs. And that doesn't count the people whose families work multiple jobs and still can't cover their cost of living. Even more unfortunately, banks that were bailed out by you and me, banks that put us in this mess in the first place, are still taking away people's homes for bad mortgages that they wrote. But the reality is it's not that bad for everyone. Some people are doing great. Now, while workers see their wages cuts, their jobs shipped overseas, their unions busted, the good times keep rolling for CEOs. It's never been better. The bonuses keep growing and growing and growing. Now, in many ways, these CEOs are playing a real-life version of Monopoly. Unfortunately, in the real world, though, there are only a few players who start out with lots and lots of money and, as we speak, are scrambling around the board trying to snatch up the rest. And unfortunately, unlike Monopoly, we don't have a seat at the table. Furthermore, even though we're not at the table, we still lose. We still feel the pain of losing whether it's destroying our meager social safety nets or busting our unions, they're in it to the last drop. And we're feeling it every turn. If our problem is people hoarding wealth and a system that puts profit before people on the planet, what's the answer? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> the answer is an economy that is rooted in equality and democracy. That's why the organization that we're a part of, the Toolbox for Education and Social Action, is part of the cooperative movement. In fact, Tessa is itself a worker-owned cooperative. And as such, we dedicate a lot of our resources to supporting the cooperative movement. Our trade is we develop educational resources for social and economic change, so it fits. But we've done a lot for the co-op movement, and part of that includes developing the game Coopoly, the game of cooperatives. And we've also worked with uh, folks all around the country to develop co-op workshops, academies, and programs. What we're trying to do is help people in uh, you know, historically impoverished areas and, and just all around the world, learn about what cooperatives are, how they cultivate stronger communities, and what cooperation takes. So what exactly is a cooperative? A co-op is a group of people, voluntarily united, with the goal of meeting their common social, economic, and cultural needs and desires through a democratically owned enterprise. In a nutshell, 
A co-op is equally owned and democratically owned by the people that use the co-op, called the membership, it is democratically controlled by this membership, and it equitably benefits these people as well. So there are scores of different kinds of co-ops all around the country, uh, in different communities, rural and urban, and they serve in every sector and industry. In fact, 2012 has been declared by the United Nations as the International Year of Cooperatives, with the slogan that cooperative enterprises build a better world. Let me continue to ground this in the work that Brian and I do. The way Tessa is run, Brian and I equally own the business. That is, we both have one share and one vote. And we get to decide together how the business runs. There is no boss. After an apprenticeship period, other people who come to work for Tessa also have one share and one vote. Once they become worker owners, they work alongside us, not underneath us. Now this might seem strange to you, but really it's not. In fact, it's that democracy that we talk about all the time, just put into practice. Now, what I'm going to ask you now is something that we ask everyone that we do workshops with, co-op academies, and I think it really gets to the heart of what we're talking about. And my question for you is, can we have a big democracy? I mean, a real democracy, without lots of little, small democracies. Can we have this giant democracy that we see on the news that people spout about without democratic gas stations, bookstores, grocery stores, banks, you name it. Right now, though, we have an economy that's based on exploitation and inequality. In turn, this creates a society based on those same corrupted and corroding pillars. Now, if we want a society rooted in democracy, and I mean real democracy, not the vote once in no November democracy, then we need to have a democracy and an economy that is built on equality. To do that, we need to build organizations, businesses, and day-to-day -day practices that are truly democratic. And that's exactly what cooperatives are trying to do. Cooperatives are democratic businesses and organizations, equally owned and controlled by one group of people. You can have financial co-ops, consumer co-ops, hybrid co-ops, worker, worker co-ops, you name it. Any business or organization can be a co-op. Two, because cooperatives are democratically owned and controlled, they keep money in their community and jobs. Now I live in Holyoke. Holyoke used to be one of the most powerful cities in the country, if not the world. And that is due to the fact that it had one of the strongest manufacturing bases in the country. Surprise, surprise, the manufacturing base left town. Holyoke is now a shell of its former self. One question I have for you right now is, do you think that would have happened if the people who worked in those factories owned those factories? Furthermore, do you think that they would have sent their kids to the line to put their hands into these machines, have them torn apart instead of going to school? Three. Cooperatives aren't a far-off theory. Cooperatives offer achievable and practical solutions to many economic, environmental, and social issues that we face today. Furthermore, they can be implemented right now. Four, co-ops aren't charity. They're empowering means for self-help and solidarity. And one great illustration of this is the work that we're doing with the Green Worker Cooperatives, which is based in the South Bronx of uh, New York City. Um, so the South Bronx is facing this environmental and economic crisis. And with Green Worker, based in that community, we're helping them run co-op academies to help folks start businesses that are owned and rooted in their communities. These people are not waiting on outside grantors or donors to put money into the, uh, into the community. Rather, they're working together and with their own ingenuity and control, they're figuring out the solutions and they're making them happen. Five. Members of cooperatives equally share the burden in hard times and the benefits in good times. Six, cooperatives are more resilient in economic downturns and in impoverished communities. When other businesses may close up shop, lay off workers, cooperatives come together and try and find a way out. So one re really recent instance of this that we've talked a lot about in our various co-op workshops with folks that have found it really interesting is the Red and Black Cafe, which is a worker co-op in Portland, Oregon. Um, after the economic recession has been dragging on for years, lots of businesses and restaurants have been closing. And recently, the, the crisis, the financial crisis, just became too much for Red and Black, the co-op, 
the bear. You know, usually in the news, when you hear a story like this, the, the next part is, so the business closed, or they laid off workers, or all these wages and benefits are cut. With red and black, it was different. The workers got together and they said, how can we get out of this? And what they decided was, we're not going to pay ourselves for over a month. And we're going to save up money, and we're going to keep our business going. Now, it's harsh, but it was their democratic decision. And this way, no one lost their job. And once they made it through it, they were able to start paying each other again, rather than some outside entity willy-nilly laying people off. Seven, cooperatives are an international movement. There are thousands upon thousands of cooperatives around the world doing amazing work, both locally and globally. So uh, the Mondragon system, which is based in Spain, is an example that the people we work with find really interesting. And uh, in a nutshell, it's a worker co-op system of over 200 co-ops and is run and owned by nearly 100,000 people, all equally. It was founded in the 1950s in Spain, in the Basque region, and it helped lift the area that it's in out of poverty, and it continues to do so today. And this is just one example of entire co-op systems that are making fundamental changes to communities around the world. Eight. Cooperatives strive to make people's lives, communities, and economies more just, equitable, and democratic. The cab industry is one of the most exploitative and abusive industries in the country, but not for everyone. Born out of the uh, a series of strikes in the 1970s, Union Cab in Madison, Wisconsin, now employs and is equally owned by over 200 people. Every per permanent worker, from the dispatchers to the drivers, are equal owners of the business. The way that most uh, cab companies work is the cabs are actually considered independent contractors. And so they have to rent the car out from the company. And at the end of the day, if they haven't made enough wages, they actually have to pay for that day of work. It's not the way it is at Union Cab. The workers control the business, they own its assets, this includes the cars, and they decide democratically how they are compensated fairly. One point to sort of drive this home is that Union Cab may be the only cab company to provide its drivers with health care. And, you know, this is really the cooperative difference in action. Nine. There's no one right way to do co-ops. They can be designed to, sit, to fit different individuals and communities' needs. There are co-ops like Mondragon that have hundreds of thousands of people, and there's co-ops like Tessa that just have four worker owners. And ten. Cooperatives are viable and just alternatives to meeting our economic and social needs in contrast to corporations which exploit people and the planet. These reasons are really powerful examples of how the cooperative movement can fundamentally change our economies, our communities, and our entire society. And that's why Tessa is so dedicated to this work. Every day, we're working to organize around and educate for co-ops. As a part of this, Tessa is a member of the Valley Alliance of Worker Cooperatives, right here in the Pioneer Valley of Massachusetts, which is made up of a little over nine worker co-ops. We, together, pool our resources and our skills and our knowledge to provide mutual aid to the other co-ops, to help us be stronger together. And we're also pooling these resources and knowledge and skills and money together to help start more co-ops right here in our backyard. So maybe someday we can have something going in the vein of the Basque movement. All of this, all these success stories, are really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of stories that of successful co-ops out there making fundamental changes um, on the large scale and the small scale. What we want you to walk away from this talk excited about is how cooperatives can really make a difference. And we really want to give you the tool, some tools and resources and ideas about how to engage in this movement. Since we have a really good example of the economic problem, as portrayed by Monopoly, Tessa created an, a way to explore the alternative, Cooply. This is a game of skill and solidarity, where everyone wins or everyone loses. Players work together to run a cooperative, and through you know, a lot of teamwork, they have to jumpstart the cooperative movement in their community. But if one player or the entire co-op goes bankrupt, the game's over for everyone. Cooply has been a huge success, and we've distributed it to over 20 countries and hundreds of communities around the world. While games like Mono Monopoly allow us to really explore and come to understand the economic problem, and it presents that problem fantastically, Cooply really offers the solution. You can play one game to learn about the dangers of an uh, economy based on um, inequality and exploitation, and you can play another about to learn, uh, to learn the way towards true democracy. Going along the same vein as what Brian is saying, we want to leave you here with some tools and some resources. One of the amazing things about co-ops co as opposed to traditional businesses is whereas a traditional business might say, 
No, we have to hold our trade secrets close. Or we're afraid that our competitors are going to put us out of business. In fact, in the cooperative principles, it's written down that you are to cooperate with other cooperatives. And you are to educate people about cooperatives. So I encourage you to look up some co-op academies, co-op development organizations, or just speak to someone in a cooperative because I know they'd be more than happy to talk to you. To finish things off, really what Brian and I are getting at and what we try and do every single day is to get the point across that an economy based on inequality and exploitation will corrode any sense of true democracy. You simply can't have both. The way forward, the way beyond corporate greed and economic exploitation, is to build an economy accountable to its people and its communities. The way forward is the cooperative movement.